Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Valley Forge Baptist Temple live stream. I'm so glad that you could join us today uh, for this very special and unique service. Uh, this is certainly a new experience for all of us here. If you're watching now, that means you have that means you have electricity and you have warmth and you are safe at home. And right now, 150 families are joining us as well. So if you want to take a moment, if you have a friend or a family member uh, or another church member you think that might not know about this, you, if you want to give them a text and encourage them to join us at this time, uh, that will be tremendous. Well, we have this beautiful blanket of snow around us, and it reminds us of Isaiah 1, 18. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, uh, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Now, some of you might be in your pajamas this morning, and that's okay, uh, because I can't see you. Uh, my brother wanted me to decide between the uh, Spider-Man pajamas or the Snoopy pajamas, but, well, I decided to go ahead and get dressed just to be, uh, just to be safe. We're definitely going to have a shorter service today. Uh, we won't be able to sing together as a congregation. We won't be able to have our ABF or have coffee together. Uh, but some staff members reminded me to remind you that there is something we can do together with this technology, and that is to be able to have our worship and giving online. So if you've never done that, this is probably a good day to be able to check that out and try that. We also have some message notes to go along with this message today. You probably saw the tab there on the home page. And so if you would like to download that, print that, or if you have a tablet or an iPad, if you want to bring that up, uh, you'll be able to, to follow along as well. And so while you're doing that, if you'd like to be able to, uh, to pull up the notes, I have just a couple of uh, things to mention to you, uh, and that is we are snowed in here. Uh, snow plow tried to open up my dra driveway last night, got stuck, uh, so you might be in a similar situation. Uh, in just a couple of hours, they're going to be plowing the church lot, and for those who are able uh, to come out anytime, say after 3 o'clock, if uh, the smaller trucks with plows or if you have a snow shovel and want to join the snow crew to try and clear the sidewalks uh, anytime after 3 o'clock today, and uh, we'll have you park probably out front be able to do that. A couple of things that are happening this week we want you to know about. There is no evening service tonight. There will be no live stream. Uh, that would be a great opportunity to be able to, uh, to pull up an old archive message, if you like, uh, there on the website. And then on Tuesday is the widow's lunch, the gal's lunch, and that is at 11 o'clock. And we should be able to have our regular services uh, throughout the week, Wednesday, School of the Bible Saturday, Youth Basketball Saturday, Guardian Angels have a meeting on Saturday as well. Hospitality night is next Sunday night. And so all of our staff have opened their homes. Uh, I know many of you are going to sign up today, so either on Wednesday or, or um, uh, next Sunday if you want to sign up. Uh, we're, we have room to have about 25 uh, to join us, and so uh, many of our staff members have that. So just stop by the elevator. Yes, that was my dog that just sneezed. That's never happened uh, during church before either. Uh, but we have, uh, uh, we'd love to have you over to our home as well as the other staff members, and so that's coming up. Congratulations to Bob and Christy Porter on the birth of their daughter. And so she made it just in time before the uh, storm. Also, there's a clothing drive. If you'd like to be able to help others in need, you can bring clothing, purses, belts, shoes, linens, drapery, bedding, stuffed animals, hard toys, put them in a plastic bag, and then next Saturday, Sunday, drop them off in the uh, Family Life Center on the Black Rock Road side between 10 and 2 on Saturday before and after services on Sunday. And so those are some things that we wanted you to, uh, to be able to, to know about. All right, so if you want to join uh, my family now, opening the Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, we'd like to be able to take a few moments together here and look into God's Word. We're coming to the last chapter of this book, and it has been a great help to me personally, and I hope that it's been a great help to you as we've studied this book. We come to the last chapter now in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, and, and Paul's going to ask a question that's very important for all of us to help not just ourselves, but to help others. And the question is, are you really a Christian? 
Is your faith real? Now, the church in Corinth was a very large church. Uh, we believe that it could have had 1,000, 2,000 members or even more. Jesus said there were much people in that city that belonged to him in salvation. So, so Paul, he, he probably led hundreds of these people to Christ one-on-one. -on -one. He probably led hundreds of these people to Christ uh, through his public preaching ministry. And so, so we can assume that the vast majority of the church members in Corinth were born again. They were truly a part of God's family. And yet some false teachers had come in, and some people had been following uh, those false teachers. So there are some uh, that are not truly saved. And so what you have here is a church that is mostly filled with saved people, but there are some unsaved people. So the message in these two verses are directed to both the saved and the unsaved. So would you please follow with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and look with me at verses 5 and 6 what the Apostle Paul says. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. Let's ask God to be able to open his word to our hearts. May we pray. Father, thank you for this uh, unique opportunity to gather uh, with our church family and others uh, through this live stream. I pray that now you take your word and open it to our hearts. I think of our missionaries on the mission field and others around the country uh, that are tuning in. I pray that that your truth will impact each one of us as we seek to understand in a better way how we can have full assurance of our salvation and share that with others. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, I, as I thought about this message, I thought about my own life, and certainly it's something that has happened to all of us. And the question is, have you ever had doubts about your salvation? Have you ever wondered, am I truly saved? Am I truly in the family of God? Uh, maybe it came across this way. Did I, did I do the right thing to become a Christian? Did I say the right words? Did I pray the right prayer? Was I really sincere enough when I asked Jesus Christ to come into my heart and life? Well, I asked the Lord to become my Savior. I was about 15 and a half uh, in the fall of 1975. My family and I had been attending church for about four months, and there was just one particular Sunday morning where the Holy Spirit really convicted me of my sin, and I knew that I was lost. I knew that I could not get to heaven with my good works, my baby baptism, and there on the center aisle, about four or five rows back, I prayed during that invitation prayer, and I asked Jesus to come into my heart. I asked God to forgive my sins. I believe that Jesus was the only way to heaven and that he died for me and rose again. Well, it wasn't just but a couple of months later the pastor came by and, and my brother and I met with him over that Christmas season. And then the first Sunday of 1976, Steve and I uh, were both baptized. And that's when my Sunday school teacher gave me that little note, I will read through my Bible in 1976. And so as a 16-year-old, I began reading through my Bible uh, for the first time in my life. My, I didn't have a Bible, my parents got me one. And as I'm reading through my Bible, and I'm going now to church faithfully, uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday, visitation, I'm growing in my faith. But then something happened that fall. An evangelist came to our church, and, and uh, God used him in a great way. But one thing that he said didn't help me, and it didn't help a lot of other people. He said this. He said, if you don't know the date of your salvation, you're probably not saved. You're probably not a Christian. And that made, made me think, what was the date of my salvation? I had no clue. I, I remember that it was in the fall, uh, but I couldn't remember at all. And so for the first time in my Christian life, I began to doubt my salvation. I began to think these thoughts. Am I, am I really saved? What if I die without being saved? Will I be one of the ones that Jesus will say to, depart from me, I never knew you? And so it, it, it really bothered me. I'm doubting my salvation. I'm not sure if I'm saved. And I remember that week uh, being so burdened with these doubts uh, that there in my bedroom, I got on my knees and I prayed, Lord, I love you. 
Lord, I, I believe that Jesus died for me and rose again, and I, uh, if I'm not saved, I'm, I'm trusting you right now. I believe, 1 John 5, 13, these things have I written unto you, that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know he have eternal life. And Lord, I believe in Jesus Christ. Please, please give me assurance in my heart. Please give me peace in my heart. And do you know what happened? He did. He gave me the peace. He gave me the assurance of my salvation. But guess what? I didn't write that date down either. <laughs> so I don't have that date written down. But I know that I'm saved. I know that I'm a Christian. God wants you to know that you are a Christian. He wants you to know that you're saved. But look what Paul says here in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves. Prove your own selves. Is Paul trying to get us to doubt our salvation? Well, certainly not. But Paul wants us to be very serious and sober-minded about what's in our heart, what's in our soul. Examine yourselves, test yourselves, prove yourselves. Make sure that your faith is real. Make sure that you are solid in the faith. Have these regular checkups. Don't just pretend that you are a Christian. Make sure you really are on the road to heaven. We all have to understand something that Jesus said. Everyone, everyone is either saved or unsaved. Everyone is either a believer or an unbeliever. Everyone is either on the, 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 the narrow road that leads to heaven or they're on the broad road that leads to hell. In Matthew 7, 13 to 14, Jesus Christ couldn't be clear. There's only two kinds of people in the world. Saved and lost. Which one are you? You don't evolve into a Christian. You're not born as a Christian uh, when, when uh, you had your birth date. Uh, you don't become a Christian uh, by getting baptized. You become a Christian when you call upon the name of the Lord and you sincerely understand you can't get to heaven with your own good works, but you trust Christ and you ask Him for forgiveness. You know, sadly, many churches... Many denominations, uh, many religious systems say you cannot know for certain you're going to heaven. In fact, one even claims that anathema upon you if you say that you're going to heaven. They claim that if you say with confidence that heaven is your home, they claim that you can only say that with pride and with presumption. You're presumptuous. But nothing could be further from, from the truth. God wants you to have this peace and assurance you can trust His promise. Jesus said, I'm giving you my promise that you may know that you have eternal life. So, so why do Christians doubt if they're really saved? We're going to look at some of those answers in, in just a few moments here. But here's a question. If I doubt my salvation, does that mean I'm not saved or I might not be saved? And the answer is no. Doubt can show up many different ways. It can show up in fear. It can show up in anxiety. It can show up in worry. Um, I, uh, I remembered a time that some of our church members uh, were flying on a plane. It was uh, Pastor Joyner and Peggy and the Zostex. They were flying back from somewhere, and the plane, late at night, was struck by lightning. I mean, there was a flash. There was a shaking. Uh, there, were, there was uh, some, some visible effects of it. Uh, uh, Brother Zacchaeus was working the uh, uh, control tower that night. And I want you to know that that kind of shook them up, everybody in the plane. There was this worry. There was this anxiety. Are we going to make it back to Philadelphia or not? I want you to know that they did land safely. Uh, but even though they had worry and fears and anxiety, that plane was safe. Uh, the pilot was skilled, and uh, uh, it, it appears that, that each commercial airplane in the United States is struck by lightning about once a year. So it's pretty common, but they have built into these planes the, the lightning protection systems. And so even though they're safe, they may not feel safe because it was just struck by lightning. And so it is when we go through these storms of life, that we may not feel safe, but God the Father is our pilot and our salvation is secure. So why do people have doubts? Why do people doubt their salvation? Well, if you have those notes or you can pull it up, uh, here, here are some of those answers. The first answer is they are not genuinely saved. Do you know that if you're not truly born again, 
you're going to doubt your salvation because you don't have it. Uh, Romans 8 says that the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if you don't have that in your heart, in your life, that the Holy Spirit is confirming in your heart, in your soul that you're saved, it may be that you're not saved. Because God promised in Romans 8 and verse 16 that He will bear witness. What does that mean? That means I have a peace. I have a peace in my heart that when I die, I'm going to go to heaven because I have His salvation. Here, here's another reason people doubt their salvation. A lack of Bible knowledge or false teaching. And you know, if you, if you fill your mind by reading skeptics, if you fill your mind by reading uh, or listening to those who deny the Bible, who doubt the Bible, that's going to implant doubts in your heart. It happened to me. It even came from an evangelist. He said a lot of good things, but he said something that wasn't so good. He said, you have to know the date of your salvation to be saved or you're probably not saved. That is simply not true. That is not found in the Bible. And so, so others might be taught that they can lose their salvation through a teaching of a church or a book or a blog, but you need to come back to what the Bible says. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, the Bible says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. And so, so if you doubt, it might be because you're not saved. It might be because you have been reading or listening to, to a false teaching or a lack of Bible knowledge. Here's another reason that people doubt their salvation. A strained relationship with your parents. A strained relationship with your parents. Our first impression about God the Father comes from our earthly father. Now, many of you were brought up in homes where mom and dad, uh, they loved God, they loved you, and you have a great impression of God in heaven. Uh, but some, some of you may project a false view on God, and you picked it up from your earthly parents. What do I mean? You know, it's easy to confuse the conditional love from earthly parents with your unconditional love from your heavenly father. And so we need to base our view, our attitude, our understanding about God on what we read in the Bible, not some personal family experience. Here's another reason and the most common reason among uh, Christians who were saved as adults of why they might doubt their salvation, and that would be sin. Sin. Uh, my heart is so far from God that I have these doubts if I'm really saved. As a Christian, my sin breaks my fellowship and that sweet communion with God. And so 1 John 1, 9 is something that every single one of us need to be practicing every single day. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What that means is I don't pray again and again to be saved, but I pray and I agree with God and I, I keep short accounts, I quickly confess my sin and restore that fellowship that's broken by, by my sin. Sin will create doubt in my heart. I'll feel distant from God and doubt my salvation. Now, here, here's a, a doubt that a lot of, a lot of uh, teenagers and even single adults uh, face, and that is they were saved as a, a, uh, a young child, maybe four, five, six, seven years of age, and that is memory, memory. I was so young that I can't remember my salvation. You know, my, my parents tell me, we wrote a note in my Bible, but I just can't remember it. I remember getting baptized, but I can't remember getting saved. Well, if you had that experience, then you need to do exactly what I did, and that is to pray for reassurance, and you just recommit uh, your life to the Lord and then I would suggest to write down the date. Right? Just get a Bible and write down the date, that prayer of reassurance. One last reason people doubt their salvation, and that is an overly sensitive conscience. You know, some people, they just say, you know, I'm basically just an insecure person. And, and an overly sensitive conscience, that can result from many different things. It can result from the influence of parents, uh, from some type of abuse. It could be from reading the wrong materials. It could be just a lack of faith to fully accept and embrace God's love for you and God's forgiveness to you. Now, the key to being spiritually healthy and rejoicing as Christ is it's to know the truth, to believe the truth, and to be able to accept it into your heart and life, the truth about God, the truth about yourself. You see, your, your believing affects your feeling. 
Here's the truth. God loves you. Christ died for you. Here's the truth. God saved you when you trusted Christ. Here's the truth. You cannot lose your salvation. Here's the truth. You don't deserve to be saved, but you sure can live with peace and confidence and assurance and joy every day. You know, this is what God wants for you. He does not want you to live in a fog of doubt. Uh, God's, God wants you to have peace and assurance. Uh, he wants you to have this joy. But we live in a world that is filled with so many voices that doubt Christ and deny Christ. But you don't have to live that way. So how do you deal with doubt? How do you deal with these, these doubts or how do you help others? Well, I, I heard this story about how, how one jury was dealing with doubt. You see, there was a defendant who was on trial for murder in Oklahoma. Strong evidence indicating uh, the guilt of this man, but there was no corpse, no body. In the defense attorney's closing statement, the lawyer said, knowing that his client will probably be convicted, he resorted to a trick. He said this, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I have a surprise for you all. The lawyer said as he looked at his watch, within one minute, the person presumed to be dead, in this case, will walk into this courtroom. And he looked and pointed to the courtroom door. The jurors, somewhat stunned, they too looked eagerly at the courtroom door. Well, a minute passed. Nothing happened. Finally, the lawyer said, actually, I made up the previous statement, but you all looked with anticipation, which proves there is reasonable doubt in your mind, in this case, as to anyone was actually ever killed or not. And I insist, based upon that reasonable doubt, that you return a verdict of not guilty. The jury, clearly confused, retired to deliberate their decision. A few minutes later, they returned and pronounced a verdict of guilty. But how, asked the lawyer, you must have had some doubt. I saw all of you look and stare at the courtroom door. Well, the foreman of the jury said, oh, yes. We all did look at the door in doubt, but your client did not look. And so the criminal, he didn't look. He was not expecting someone to come through that door because he had firsthand experience that he was guilty. So how are you going to deal with these, the, these, uh, these doubts? Well, there, if you have the notes, you can see what's the truth about doubt. For some Christians, having doubt is a, is a crisis for them. They begin to wonder if they can truly be a Christian if they have feelings of doubt. As a result, some Christians are afraid to express their doubts. Uh, the questions begin to, to choke out their faith and their spiritual growth. The question begins to, to, uh, to just consume them. Can a person be a Christian and have doubt? And the answer is yes. So there we see the truth about doubt. First of all, don't confuse faith with feelings. Don't confuse faith with feelings. Some people mistakenly think that, that, that faith means a continuous religious high. When the religious high or feeling wears off, and it will, uh, these people begin to doubt whether their faith is real. Maybe I don't have faith because my feeling of euphoria is gone. So don't confuse faith and feeling. Secondly, it's okay to ask honest questions. Some people think we should never ask questions about our faith, but that's wrong. You know, Jesus uh, did not rebuke John the Baptist as he expressed his doubts and questions in Matthew chapter 11. Now, understand the scene. John the Baptist was born a few months before Jesus, and when he uh, became a preacher, uh, he called the nation to repentance. He's the forerunner of Christ, and he uh, baptized people who put their faith in the Lord. Jesus appears on the scene to get baptized, and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. John said, I'm not even worthy to unloose the latchet of his sandal, his shoe. John the Baptist baptized Jesus. John's disciples began to follow Jesus. John gets arrested and he is put into prison. He is facing death in that dungeon. And that is enough darkness to discourage any man. 
John begins to get reports about Jesus. And so he says to some of his disciples, go and ask him, are you the one or do we look for another? Was God's kingdom not here? Was not the king here? Why was darkness still reigning when the king of light was here? John didn't understand. And so let, let's learn something about doubt as John experienced in this dungeon of doubt. He's seeking honest answers from Jesus. I mean, how could the same guy who baptized Jesus, the same guy who said, uh, I'm not only the forerunner, but this is the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. How could he say, are you the one or do we look for another? He had some intellectual doubts. Maybe he had some emotional doubts. But Jesus answered his doubts. Jesus didn't rebuke him. Jesus said, I want you to go and tell John what you've seen. You tell John that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed. You tell John that the deaf hear. You tell John that the dead are raised and that the gospel is preached to the poor. And that will convince him, I am the Messiah. And they did just that. Jesus answered John's questions. He'll answer your questions too. So some doubts are intellectual. John may have needed just some simple reassurance. He had some puzzling questions. Uh, do you remember that, that, that he preached that, that Jesus will come, the Messiah will come and baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire, which means judgment. And so he's looking back to those Old Testament prophecies that Messiah will set up a kingdom. And here is Jesus preaching grace and mercy and salvation. And, and so he had to be reminded of those other Old Testament prophecies, Isaiah 35, Isaiah 61, that Jesus will come to purchase our salvation the first time, grace and mercy. He will come the second time with judgment. And so some doubt is intellectual. Those doubts were answered. Some doubts are emotional. Uh, maybe John's doubts were not all intellectual. Maybe he just had a few why questions. Why is evil still here in this world if the king has come? He may have been thinking, I, I love God. I've served God. Uh, I, I bowed to the forerunner. My disciples follow him. I'm in prison and I'm going to die. I'm going to be martyred because I'm doing the right thing. He had some doubts as he awaited his possible execution. And the darkness created these doubts. And so you have intellectual doubts, emotional doubts. Intellectual doubts ask questions like, well, if, if miracles, the miracles of God contradict science, then how can any rational person believe that they're true? If God cares about people that he created, how could he allow them to go to hell? Emotional doubts ask questions like, well, if there's a loving God, why is there suffering in the world? Why is there evil in the world? Uh, the questions can really get emotional when we have a personal trial. What about my son, my daughter, my family member? Why didn't God save them? And so if, if you're dealing with doubts, there's a, there's a couple of good books. Uh, we have uh, some of them in the bookstore. Uh, the Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. He also did one called The Case for Faith. And here's one you probably get online. Why Believe the Bible by John MacArthur. And so God does have answers uh, to these questions. So the, the next thing about doubt I'd like to say is doubt is not the problem, but unbelief is. There's a difference between doubt and unbelief. Doubt is can't believe. Unbelief is won't believe. Doubt is honesty. Unbelief is obstinacy. Doubt is, is looking for the light, looking for the answers. Unbelief is content with darkness. Some people have le legitimate doubts. And I want you to know that God answers those doubts. I think of Thomas. Here is Thomas on, on a resurrection uh, Sunday night after Jesus had appeared sometime during that week. He says, I will not believe. I have doubts. We call him Doubting Thomas. The second Sunday after resurrection, Jesus appeared. He went right to the doubter. He went right to be able to answer his questions. Thomas, look, see, touch. Get answers to your questions. Look at the nail prints in my hand and sighed. Be not faithless, but believing. Jesus is not upset at honest doubters. He said this about John the Baptist after he expressed his doubt. 
There has never been a greater man born among women than John the Baptist. And so he answered his questions, and clearly he praised John, complimented him about his faith. John's doubts did not deny his faith. There's a difference between doubts and smoke screens. Uh, there are those who, who don't want to believe. They don't want Christianity to be true because if Jesus is, is truly the Son of God, the Savior, the Judge, that means they have to change their immoral lifestyle. They have to change their selfishness. They have to bow to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And so they, they don't want to believe. That's different. That's different. In fact, uh, the Bible says, according to John 3, Jesus said they love darkness more than light because their deeds are evil. Now let me kind of illustrate it this way to see if you're understanding what, what, how God wants to deal with these doubts. Um, you say, well, I, I, I think the Bible's true. I'm, I'm just not sure. But you don't know for sure. So I have something in my pocket, and you can imagine what it is. I'll tell you what it is. Uh, uh, it's round, and it's thin, and I got my finger on it now. So you're probably, maybe you can see here, uh, the impression through my pants. You, so what is it? Well, you say it's probably a coin. Well, you're right. I've got a, I've got a coin in my pocket. Now I'm going to tell you, I've got a quarter in my pocket. Now, for you to believe that, you have to believe it by faith. There's some evidence. Uh, there is uh, a testimony, my testimony, that I've got a quarter in my pocket. But I'm now going to take away your faith. And the way I'm going to take away your faith is this. I'm going to show it to you. And so now... I show it to you, and you no longer have faith that I have a quarter in my hand because now you can see it, you can, you can touch it. So you're, you don't, no longer have faith because it's now a fact and you can see it. And, and so it is with, with our faith in God and in Jesus Christ. There is corroborative evidence, but God has set it up in such a way that He is not going to appear in the sky he wants you to believe. He wants you to believe evidence that points to Him. Now, you have a choice. And the choice is to believe or not believe. Without faith, it is impossible uh, to come to God unless you believe in your heart. So God, He wants us to believe, but you have to make a choice. So why people doubt their salvation? Some truths about doubt. Now we get to the text Examine yourselves. Prove yourselves. And that's what he says. Paul says, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves. So here, here, here it is. How can I prove my salvation? How can I help someone else who is in doubt? These are the marks. So take a spiritual inventory. Prove your own selves, Paul says. What's the proof? Well, here, here it is. The first proof, the first evidence is, do I have a desire to confess my sin. Does sin bother you? Does your sin bother you? Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You have to believe and realize you are spiritually bankrupt. You have to understand your spiritual poverty and have an overwhelming sense of your sinfulness. And if you've never had that, well, you can't be saved. You can't be saved unless you are first lost. You can't be saved unless you understand you can't get to heaven without God. You can't do it on your own. Jesus said, um, uh, they that be whole, they that be healthy, do not need a physician, only those that are sick. And when you realize you are spiritually and sinfully sick with sin, you need a Savior. And Jesus Christ is that Savior. The next beatitude says this, Blessed are they that mourn. That is, mourn over your sin. And if there's no sorrow for sin, if sin doesn't bother you, that you're offending God, that you've sinned against God, you can't be saved. But if sin bothers you, then you can be saved. And so the first mark is, do I have a desire to confess my sin? And the second one is the opposite of that. Do I have a desire for righteousness? That next beatitude says this, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Here you are snowed in on a Sunday morning, two feet of snow out there, and you're taking the time to be able to gather in this very unusual church service. It says you have a desire for righteousness. You want to open the Bible. You want to hear from heaven. You want to hear the voice of God. That is a mark. 
that uh, God and His Spirit are inside of you. The third mark is this. Do I have a desire to submit to God? Do I have a desire to submit to God? Is there a compelling uh, force within you that says, I want to submit to divine authority? Do you find yourself saying, I want to be a servant of God. I want to love God and serve God and love others and serve others. Or you like that rich young ruler. When he came to Christ, he said, I've kept the commandments. Jesus said, you lack one thing. Go sell all you have, give to the poor and have treasure in heaven. Jesus was not saying that this is the way to heaven. He said, this is the way to have treasure in heaven. But he looked into that man's heart and saw that he did not want to truly follow Christ. And so do you want to follow Christ? Is it number one in your life that Jesus Christ is your Lord, He is your Master, and you'll do whatever He says, uh, even if it disagrees with, with what is what you want to do? And that becomes the fourth mark. Do I have a desire for obedience? Jesus said, if ye love me, keep my commandments. Now reverse that. If you don't love me, then you're not going to keep my commandments. Oh, it should be so important to us that we care what's in this book and we follow what God says in the Bible. And if we love God, we're going to obey Him. And then we come to that last and great evidence, and that is love. Jesus said, By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that you have love one to another. May I say that starts in the home? If you're married, it's between a husband and wife. If you have children, parents, it's loving the the Christian starting in your own home, starting in, 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 in your class, in your ABF, in your church. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples. You have love one to another. And so these are evidences. Do I have a desire to confess my sin, a desire for righteousness, a desire to submit to God in obedience to God, and in, in love. So, so here we are, come to the end of the message. It's so important for you. It's so important for others. Uh, we have a great book in the bookstore called Done by Carrie Schmidt, what most religions don't tell you uh, about the Bible. And so these things will help build your faith and help you to help others. But we're going to find ourselves or find others that they get to this place in their life and they're just doubting their salvation. And so I I have in your notes, and you can download it later if you don't have it yet, and that would be 10 tests of salvation. But before I give them to you, you need to know God wants you to live with assurance. Back to that verse that helped me, 1 John 5, 13. These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that ye may know, you can underline that in your Bible, ye may know you have eternal life, and that you may believe in the name of the Son of God. It's so important not just to go through life consumed with the things of the world, consumed with what makes me happy, but I need to know for certain that my salvation is genuine and that it's real. Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. And so once you're saved, once you're saved, then you take the next step, and that's baptism. Once you're saved, you begin to be all in and say, God, I will do whatever you want me to do. Now, what that means here in this text is Paul is saying, Paul is saying, my proof and evidence of my apostleship is your salvation. Church family in Corinth, you're saved, and because you're saved, I brought you the message of the gospel, and I am an apostle. So, So the evidence and the proof of his apostleship comes back to their salvation. And that's why he says, but I trust you shall not know that we are not reprobates uh, and and that you are not reprobates as well. So here it is. The 10 tests of salvation. I'll give you 10 questions. They all come from 1 John. And it could be that that you're reading something, I say something, an evangelist say something, and you say, I don't know if I'm saved. Well, you let the Bible decide for you. And people have come to me and say, Pastor, I just don't, I don't know if I'm saved. I say, read 1 John, and you answer these questions, yes or no. Here are the 10 tests of genuine salvation from 1 John. Do you enjoy fellowship with God and other Christians? Yes or no? That's uh, 1 John 1, 3, and 7. Are you sensitive to sin in your life? Yes or no? Do you keep His commandments? 
Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Yes or no? Do you love God more than the world? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Number five, do you seek to live a pure life because you love the Lord's return? If you're saved and you know Jesus is coming again, then you want to be living a pure life. Have you stopped practicing sin as a regular way of life? doesn't mean we're perfect, but it means we're not, we don't have perfection, but the direction should be towards God. Do you love other Christians? Can you discern between spiritual truth and error? Have you experienced conviction and peace? You see, the Holy Spirit is in you, and if the Holy Spirit is in you, when you sin, you will feel guilty. And when you do right, you will feel affirmed and confirmed. Then the last test is, do you experience answered prayer? Do you experience answered prayer? And so from that, uh, this is how we can do yes or no. And if most of the answers to, the, to these 10 questions are yes, God says you're saved. If most of the answers to these 10 questions are no, then God says you're not saved. You need to come to Christ. So let's pray together, and we'll have some closing thoughts here. And, and may God give you safety through all of the, the digging out, and we'll see you later in this week. May we pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for these dear, sweet, precious promises. And Father, I pray now for those who may be struggling with doubt that your word will help them and bring them to full assurance. Father, I pray for those who may not be saved. May they join me in prayer right now to receive you and pray, Dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. I believe Jesus died for me and rose again. Please come into my heart and become my Lord and Savior. Now, Father, I pray for those who are strong in the faith. May they regularly examine themselves and prove themselves and live for you and help others come to know Christ as Savior. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I think someone else is going to join me unless she's asleep. Okay. And uh, so my family has joined me, but they don't want to be on camera. Uh, and that's okay. So uh, uh, we, uh, we do have some news from, uh, for the deaf ministry. Brother Bryson is taking this and he's going to upload it to Deaf Vital Signs. Reminder that the Minute to Win It activity is on February the 14th. And that is an ABF competition on Sunday night, Following the evening service, please plan on being a part of that. Uh, ladies have a chocolate and chuckles fellowship time coming up on February the 19th. The sportsman's banquet's coming up. Two people are needed for Romania. And here's my assistant nursery director. Hello, Madison. Can you wave? Can you wave at everybody out there? All right. That's terrific. Okay, well, I think that about wraps. Oh, you want to blow them a kiss? Blow a kiss. That, that's evidence that we love the brethren. Okay, yep, we blow some kisses there. So thank you so much for joining uh, me and our family in our home today for Valley Forge Baptist Temple live stream. <laughs> Be safe out there, and uh, we will see you on Wednesday night, Lord willing. And then if you'd like to help the snow crew again, they should be there anytime after after 3 o'clock. Okay, I wish I, had, I wish I had a picture, but everybody, everybody trying to get her to smile and laugh. All right, God bless you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.